just before Christmas started. Was, study of Christ, and it, it's, it's, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, all into, all into one night with that, so we're going to, we'll, uh, we're going to do it that way, so we're going to do Christianity right now, uh, bottom of page 75. The body of truth, which is now known as Christianity, was identified by the early church as the faith, and this way. Acts 9-2. According to Acts 6-7, a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Jude, verse 3, contended for the faith once for all delivered. Not until Ignatius of Antioch, right around 107, was the term Christianity introduced. It, like the word Christian, has come into general use today as a representation of that which the apostles revealed in the New Testament and was itself brought into existence by virtue of Christ's death, resurrection, and present ministry in heaven, as well as by the advent of the Holy Spirit into the world. Of all the religious systems which have been fostered in the world, but two, have the distinction of being designed, originated, and eventually, though not as yet, consummated according to the specific purpose of God. These are Judaism and Christianity. There are no other religions in the eyes of God. No matter how populated they are, no matter how, fan they, you know, how famous they are, or anything else like that, there are two that God recognizes, and only two. Though covenant theology, with its extended doctrinal influence, has either confused or ignored the distinctions which obtain between the two divinely fostered systems, which is, he's talking about Judaism and, uh, and Christianity here, um, a recognition of the difference between them is the essential foundation of any beginning or progress in the right understanding of the scriptures. To demonstrate the truthfulness of this statement, it should be added that while both of these systems incorporate instructions for daily life here on earth, it can be ascertained by reason of evidence, which any unprejudiced person may trace, that Judaism is a system belonging to one nation, Israel. That it is earthly in its scope, purpose, and the, and, the, and the destiny which it provides. While Christianity is heavenly in its scope, purpose, and the destiny which it provides, it will be seen as well, though including much that is common to both, that they are alike the outworking of opposite principles, and that they are not and could not be in force at the same time. So what he's talking about, if you go back and you read uh, uh, from Genesis 12 on, you will read about uh, uh, an earthly people that are promised a land. And everything that God promises, promises them is of the earth and it is uh, 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 in their land. Okay, That's, those are the promises uh, that are made, generally speaking. Okay, Now the believer uh, uh, is, is called in, in, uh, in, in one place, we're called pilgrims, wanderers. Okay? Uh, uh, looking for a looking for a different home, a heavenly a heavenly home, and so the uh, uh, the promises and everything that is given to the Christian 
are of a heavenly nature. Okay, so there are two distinct. And what he's talking about is, um, and what he's going to mention that here in a minute. He's going to mention how there are many people who believe that one w w was in effect, and then with its failure, the other one picked up and, and took off. Okay, and, and that's, they talk about one being the bud, uh, Judaism being the bud, and Christianity being the, being the, the, the flower. Okay, of the, of the butt. That that's how they were intended, and they and it grew in that way, and then now Christianity budded out of, grew out of Judaism. And what he's saying is that if you look, if you read the Bible in a, in a grammatical sense, the way it was intended to be read, Judaism is here, and, and it will con it continues on through eternity. Christianity uh, developed here and continues on through eternity. But those are two very different things. Judaism at this point is on the shelf. Now, there are many people that practice Judaism, I understand that. But Judaism, in the eyes of God, is on the shelf right now, okay? They have been given a, a, a spirit of stupor, says Romans 11. Uh, 9, 10, and 11 talk all about that. And, 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 and when, the, when God's dealing with the church is done, and the church is removed, Judaism will be the only thing in effect from that point on to eternity. And so they cannot coexist. Okay, and that's in, in God's eyes. In scripturally, they can't coexist. And so one was there. It is shelved. Christianity, the body of Christ, is running its, its, its time here until that final uh, 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 individual, Romans 11, 25, is brought into the body of Christ. When that happens, boom, and then God will once again pick up, pick up his dealings with the nation of Israel. I've got a question. Yes. How does Judaism go for all eternity? Uh, in the in the in the new earth, the new heaven and new earth, that new earth. I don't I don't pretend even to, uh, to have all of the answer, answers in eschatology. I don't know. I mean, there might be you might have an idea on that. What I do know is that is that in in this in that sense, Judaism will extend into eternity as uh, uh, as Christianity will in the sense that we are with Him in heaven. But the promises that were made to the Christian are, are of a heavenly nature, okay? And the promises that are made to the Jew are all of an earthly nature. Now, in this time period between the advents of Christ, Jew and Gentile alike come to Christ. They, they form that body of Christ. But when that body of Christ is full and removed, then, then Christ will once again uh, come, and then God will pick up his dealings with the nation of Israel and fulfill all of those promises that were made in the, uh, what I call the foundational testament, the Old Testament. And he will fulfill the promises that are made there. What many people believe, and that's what he's talking about, what many people have been taught is that Judaism ran its course and, and Christianity took its place. And, and, and he's saying that if you, if you read the scriptures uh, without that view in mind, if you just want to find out what it is, then you will see that there, are, that there are two distinct groups that are mentioned. And those two are the only legitimate ones in the eyes of God. One is now shelved during the, during the operation of what we call the body of Christ, the era that we are, excuse me, in right now. Yeah, but, but then the, there's a lot there. With the, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. The, you know, the, 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 the millennial kingdom will be there. At the end of the millennial kingdom, there's going to be uh, uh, Satan will be loosed. There will be another huge rebellion, an enormous rebellion, uh, of which God will, will strike down. Boom. That will be the end of that. The new heaven, the new earth will then be created. Uh, 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 but how, how all those parts fit together and work together, that's a life study. That's a life study. All I do know is that, is that they are, it is eternal, uh, and, and, but the house and the, and the, uh, in the details of that, I don't have all of those. You need another lunch. <laughs> that would be a long lunch. It would be great at lunch because, because it, it does. It does extend, and, and, and it would take a long time to work through all of those things. About an hour, and it would be a great lunch. But, uh, thank you. you do that. <laughs> what about just dessert? Yeah, always look around for me. Just dessert. Oh. Did I, was there another hand? Um, where was I? Did we got a scope? Do I have a scope? Yeah, yeah. 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 What's that? 
It will be seen. Force at the same time. Okay, it will be seen. <coughs> okay, it will be forced at the same time. Judaism alone was in action from the call of Abraham to the, to, to the death and resurrection of Christ and will again be the outworking of the divine purpose in the earth after the church has been removed. But Christianity is the only divine objective in the present age, which age is bounded by the two advents of Christ. Too often it is assumed that Judaism has been terminated or merged into Christianity. A favorite expression of this notion is to the effect that Judaism was the butt and Christianity the blossom. Over against this misconception is the truth that both Judaism and Christianity run their prescribed courses unimpaired and unconfused from their beginnings into eternity to come. By far the larger portion of Bible prophecy concerns Israel with their land. That is, the nation, the Davidic throne, the Messianic, the Messiah King, and his kingdom. This and much more, together with the eschatology, which is the study of things to come, the es es eschatology of, of Judaism. Here it can be seen again that it is exceedingly inaccurate to speak of systematic theology as Christian theology. Since the former incorporates vast ranges of truth, which are wholly foreign in their primary application to that which belongs to Christianity. Because much theological teaching is confused in these fields of truth, it is essential that particular emphasis be added here. What he's, what he's saying simply is this, that if, if, you, were to, if you were to have a, 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 a wonderful... Uh, a cake. It's a beautiful cake. Okay. Um, systematic theology is is going to is going to take that cake and work it backwards until you, until you are left with with uh, just the extended recipe. Okay, all the recipe that is there. Now, all the pieces that are there uh, of all those pieces, Christianity is just one of those that make up this cake. You see. Um, going all the way back to, to, uh, to, to, to the very beginning, and then in Genesis 12 with the, with the calling of Abram, and all of this stuff. All of these are different parts of the recipe that make this beautiful cake, but to call it Christian, systematic theology, Christian theology, is a mistake, because it only, it only covers just the frosting on it, for instance, okay? So it, it doesn't it make up all of the ingredients, and what systematic theology does generally is to, is to remove from this cake, all of the different ingredients. Some are, are, are very, very small. I bake once in a while. I don't do it a lot, but I, I love to bake. I made cookies Monday, <laughs> peanut butter cookies. They were great. Anyway, <laughs> when you follow the recipe, which I do, and I never deviate, I, I don't like when people go, oh, I'll just do this. I don't, I, I can't do that. Uh, and so I follow the recipe, and, and, uh, and when I do, they always turn out good. But, but some of the things are just a drop or just a few a few grains of something, you know, just a quarter of a teaspoon, that type of thing. You just throw it in and you wonder, why am I doing it? Why am I taking the time to put these things in there? But it has to be in there. That has to be in there in order to create this. And if you want this to be this, I mean truly this, then that has to be in there. And then you've got the big things like the, the big cups of flour itself, you know, and it's just big. So there's some parts of theology and systematic theology that are large, that are extensive, that are, you, you, you wouldn't even have the semblance of a cake without it. But, uh, uh, but, but all the pieces are necessary. But to refer to all of those pieces uh, in the same way as, as systematic theology is synonymous with Christian theology is a mistake. Because Christianity only makes up one small portion of that ingredient. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Um, Because, but, okay, I, I finished page 76. Okay. Top of 77. Though it was given to the Apostle Paul to formulate and record the realities which together constitute Christianity, he did not himself make its initial announcement. Christ, <coughs> in the upper room, discourse, John 13, 1 uh, to the end of, of chapter 17. It's a 
you've got to become very familiar with that upper room discourse. Okay, it's called the upper room discourse. In chapters 13 to the end of 17 are, uh, are, are a make, uh, there's no way of describing what that is. It's a portion of scripture that needs to be known. Let's yeah. put it that way. It just needs to be known. Um, it declared the new and vital features of Christianity. This occurred at the very end of his earthly ministry and was set forth as an anticipation of that which was about to be inaugurated. The earthly ministry of Christ was restricted in the main to Israel and carried on wholly within the scope of their covenants of promise. In the upper room discourse are found the important factors of relationship to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit which are peculiar to Christianity. However, as divinely planned, the great apostle was raised up to receive and formulate the new system based, as it is, on the death and resurrection of Christ and the values gained at Pentecost. So what he's saying is that the apostle Paul did not first announce this. The, the, the idea of Christianity was announced in that upper room discourse, chapters 13, 17, John. Okay, that's where Christ... And, and you could, in, the, in, that, in that chapter 13, you know, he's, he's washing his disciples' feet. He says, you know what I'm doing to you? And you can see their faces. It's like, I have no idea what you're doing, you know. And, uh, and even after he washed his disciples' feet, he, he got his robe back on and he went back to the table. He said, do you understand what I've done? And you can, you can hear him say, no, we don't have any idea what you've done. What, what are you doing, you know? They had no notion of what was happening. That was the, the, a, a, a beautiful illustration of, of what the Christian was to be. Okay, he, he, he gave them the, uh, 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 the beautiful illustration of, of what the Christian was, and then he began the teaching of the, of the relationship part and how that relationship was supposed to be so very close. No longer was it two individuals uh, uh, looking and talking with each other, but two members of the same body of which are in Christ. Christ is in God. And all these concepts were coming on them in that upper room discourse. A lot of weight. A lot of weight for a couple of guys that spent their whole life fishing, you know. There was a lot of weight that was there. But uh, so all that stuff was talked about there. When he speaks of the great apostle, what he's talking about is when you begin to read in, in the book of Romans, or you can do it chronologically, where you begin with the Thessalonian letters and the Corinthian letters and you work your way all the way to the end of 2 Timothy, if you want to do it that way, that's fine. But what you will find is that there is that there is teaching that is found in the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote that is not going to be found anywhere else. It's not going to be found anywhere else. Why? Because God raised him up. God raised him up, knocked him off his horse, and then raised him up and, 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 and created in him an apostle to the Jew, but, but also to the Gentile. It hadn't happened before. Because he was the one who was going to begin preaching what Christ was about to institute that he didn't even talk about in that upper room. He was talking about Christianity. He wasn't talking about the body of Christ. The, the, the disciples would have been flipped if they would have, if they would have heard all of that teaching. Okay? So all he was doing was talking about the basics of Christianity in that upper room. It was the apostle that was raised up to be the, to be the one to go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection to Jews and the Gentiles. And you can read about all the conflict that, that came along with that in the early chapters of Acts. The brothers in Jerusalem were not happy about all of some of these changes that were taking place. And then Peter with his vision, three times that vision had to come down. Three times. Because the first one he's like, nope, I'm not buying that. That's a vision from somebody else. That's not from God. Because he would not have done this. And then the vision came down again. And after the third one is when Peter finally got his act together and he said, you know what, maybe he's about to do something very different here. And he went downstairs and there were these Gentiles standing at the door saying, we were sent here to get you. So you come into our house. And he wouldn't, Peter wasn't even allowed in the house, let alone to eat with them and to fellowship with them and to proclaim a gospel expecting them to receive. And then when the Spirit came upon them, but he was just like, and that's what he told the, the brothers in Acts 15 at this great council in Acts 15. He said, I saw it with my own eyes. The Spirit, as they came on us, as he came on us in the beginning, came on these Gentiles right there when I was preaching. Couldn't believe it. And yet it happened. And the brothers in Jerusalem were like, my goodness, is God actually opening the 
door for them. So they're working through this whole thing, okay? And just prior to that is when he raised up the apostle Paul, and Paul began to preach in Damascus, and then he went off to the desert for 11 years. He, you know, he just very, uh, uh, very quiet time in the life of the apostle where he was taking in all of this information and working through and processing all of this stuff. And then he began to preach, start churches, and write letters. But he has very unique information in his letters. No one else talks about the body of Christ. Peter, there are statements that Peter makes that, that, are, that, are, that are similar, but these are after the writings of Paul. Okay, uh, and So that's why there are similarities between Paul and Peter. Paul was raised up for that purpose. And that's why he distinguishes him on, on there. But some people make the mistake, they might be thinking, there might be someone here. Say, wow, he, he sure talks about Paul a lot. Um, I, I, I thought it was Christ that really was the... Now listen, and, and I want to make this really, really clear. The teaching, every word, every syllable that came out of the apostles' mouth, every syllable was given to him by Christ. This is Christ's message, okay, that he raised up, he shook off this terrorist and, 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 and converted him right there on the spot and then gave him his words, okay? These are the words of Christ. Everything that came out of his mouth was the word of Christ, okay? So this, this well, we preach Christ, and, 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 and you know, you only talk about what Paul says. This, it's nonsense, because if you were to be obedient to Christ, then you would find out, okay, what are his last words? What are the last words of Christ? Okay, I want to know what those are, and then you will go right there to the message that he gave to his apostle, and he said, go, go out into the world. Out into the world. Jew, Gentile, doesn't matter to me. Just go out into the world. And that's what he did. And that's why he is who he is. That's why 90% of the time when I stand up here, the passage I'm going to preach on is going to come out of one of those uh, letters that he wrote. I'll go here for illustrations and here and way back there. I'll use all kinds of illustrations because the word of God is given to us for that reason. But the letters that he wrote, when it says, Dear uh, Church in Ephesus, it's Ket. Dear Ket. Right there. It's right there. And everything, everything that he writes is not only for me, but it's to me. It's to me. The words of Christ that are read in some Bibles, as in R-E-D, okay, they're no less or more inspired than the words that are proclaimed by Paul or any of the other apostles. Right. Right. Originally, that, that, that's, that's an idea that, that makes you think that the Gospels are more important than the uh, other letters of, of the New Testament. That's not true. No. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, yeah. and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction, that the man of God might be, woman of God might be perfect. That's exactly what it is. It, to put it one more way, uh, to put it one more way, um, I like the, I like the I like the book Moby Dick. It's one of the greatest books I think ever written. Herman Melville. And and and, and the, I like it because the chapters are short. You can get through like a couple of them, you know. And if you're really tired, you can just read one, you know, because they're not long chapters. But anyway, uh, but you, you get you get to the you get toward the end and and you, and you stop where where they're about to go hunting on the, the whale or, or where they're actually in the hunt of the whale. And then and then you go back and, and read again. The getting up to the to the boat and then in the boat and then hunting the whale again, but you don't you, you you never read the final four chapters, and you don't know how you don't know what the final message is. You just don't know what happens. You know, it's like watching the movie and and right before the end the power cuts out. You ever have that? The power cuts out, and you're like, okay, I don't know. I, I'm not going to go to bed until I find out how this movie ends. You know, and, and, and the book, you're reading a book, and the last page is ripped out, and you go crazy. Why? Because you don't know what happens at the very end. And, and studying the Gospels is something that we need to do. We need to understand what happened in the Gospel. We need to understand that. But when we, but when we truly want to understand the meaning of what took place, then we have to read what Christ has told his apostle in order to explain what he did. Because remember, I've said several times lately, those who were there on the hill, there were three people that knew what was going on. And only one of them perfectly knew what was going on. The other one hanging on a cross said, remember me in paradise. He didn't know what was going on. All he knew was that there was someone grand in front of him that certainly wasn't a man. That's why he said, remember me in paradise. So he recognized something there. The other one was the centurion. 
the one that probably nailed him to the cross, and he said, this surely was the Son of God. Okay, he understood what was, something was bigger than this, and the guy on the cross understood what was bigger, but no one else did. Everyone else ran, and then they went back to their old occupations. Why? Because their Messiah had been crucified. Didn't understand what was going on. Did not understand. Did not understand until Christ uh, uh, took, the, took Saul of Tarsus with this incredible memory and knowledge of, of the, that foundational testing, okay? He probably had the whole thing memorized and had worked through all of the, the side issues and all of the interpretations. The, the guy knew all of these things. And so when Christ, when Christ came to him and, said, and, 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 and knocked him off his wives, he says, who are you, Lord? Now that Lord, he had no idea he was talking to Jesus. No idea. He knew that it was someone big because he just knocked him off his horse. But he had no idea who it was. So he says, who are you, Lord? Sitting there in a, in, a, in a pile of sweat, blind. He says, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuted. And all of that stuff now, not only there on the road, but even after he got to town, and he sat there for three days without eating, drinking, or anything, blind, sitting there, he didn't sleep. He was working through all of these things that he had read about from his youth. And all of the passages that were there in the Old Testament, he was putting this name Jesus now with all of this, with all of these prophecies that were made, all of these truths that he knew but were incomplete. He was putting it all together. And he got up, uh, uh, and, and when he began to preach in the, in the very same city, there were those who ran from him. They were afraid, uh, and, as they should be, because he was there to, to arrest them. Uh, and he began to preach that Jesus was the Christ. Didn't have all the details, didn't need them all. He just knew that, that I have met, I met with a living Jesus. I just met with him, and he is the Christ. And began to preach those. And he pulled from memory passages from the Psalms, from Isaiah, from all of these different places, and proclaimed Jesus as the Christ. Yeah. Then he went into some quiet time periods in his life where Christ gave him the full, full revelation of what it was in his body of Christ. Even when Paul began to preach in Damascus, he had no idea didn't know what the body of Christ was. It had been revealed. He began to preach Christ, uh, Jesus as the Christ, the very Son of God. And so uh, the, the revelation that was given to him is the revelation of Christ. Okay, It's Jesus Christ's revelation poured into the apostle and told to distribute those, uh, 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 those messages. Thoughts or ideas? Um, okay. I forgot where I was again. Uh, sorry? Oh, point number one? We're already right there? Okay. At this, uh, at this point, certain terms with reference to their shades of meaning may well be introduced. Number one, New Testament theology, which embraces that which is distinctively Christian in the New Testament. New chapters are added to Judaism in connection with the unfolding of that which constitutes Christianity. Number two, Pauline theology, which is doctrine restricted to the writings of Paul, but which nevertheless unfolds much regarding Judaism, especially in its contrasts with Christianity. You can check, for example, the larger portion of the epistle to the Hebrews. Now, it's, the jury's still out as to whether Paul wrote Hebrews. Uh, it doesn't say that he did, and I don't think he did, actually, myself. But there are many, many, many people that, that, that do, brighter minds than mine, think that he did. I think that if he did, that he would have he would have, he would have said so. And I don't think it reads like Paul. But anyway, the, the, the Hebrews is, is a book that, that is describing the, the contrast between those things. It's a difficult book to read. It is. It's a difficult book to understand. But in essence, it's written by a Hebrew, by a Jew, uh, instructing Jews how not to be Jews anymore. It's basically the, 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 the framework of the book of Hebrews. And so if you begin a study in Hebrews, you have to begin with that mind, that, with that uh, uh, idea in your mind. All right. My gospel, number three. Romans 2.16, which designation is used by the apostle when referring to all the revelation that was given him, namely the gospel of saving grace revealed to him in Arabia. He talks about that in Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. And also the revelation respecting the church as the body of Christ, composed, as it is, 
of believing Jews and Gentiles. To all this should be added the range of truth which sets forth the Christian's peculiar responsibility in daily life with the new and incomparable provisions for holy living through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. The Apostle's designation, my gospel, is equivalent to Christianity when a direct, constructive, and unrelated to Judaism uh, cons consideration of Christianity is in view. As a summarization, it may be restated that Christianity incorporates the gospel of divine grace, which is based on the death and resurrection of Christ, the fact of the one body with all its relationships and destiny, and the new and vital way of life through the Holy Spirit's enablement. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Questions? Mm -hmm. Comments? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next week we're going to begin with the uh, the study of Christology. Uh, that takes up a whole volume uh, in this set. Uh, so this is the, the, the six pages or whatever it is is simply a, a summarization of Christology. But uh, uh, it's a vast topic and it is all focused on, on, uh, on Christ. But I look forward to going through. Uh, we'll begin with that one, uh, with that one uh, next week when everybody's fresh. Um, we're going to get to it in a couple of weeks, I'm sure. But if you want to read, um, if you want to read one of one of the chapters here in, on Judaism, it, it it focuses on Judaism, and then we just read Christianity, and so it would be a very good uh, parallel study in the course of your week. We're going to get to it in a few weeks. That's one of the 48, but uh, uh, it would not be a bad idea to uh, uh, to read ahead on that one. Oh, and now he comes in. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, in conclusion, <laughs> there are slackers, and then there are true believers. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> uh, Any more thoughts or questions or comments? I told you we'd be out of here uh, before 9. It's got to be close, though. Is it around 9? 22. Quarter to? Quarter to. The, uh, mentioned that you made of the importance of knowing the last chapters of the book of John. Yeah. From the from the eleventh to the twenty-first chapter of the book, the book of John only encompasses one week of time. One week. So that's that's very, very important week to know about. That you can take it day by day. Chapter 11 to, to Mary at the end of the, uh, at the end of the, the Gospel of John. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite stories. Did I see a hand? I thought I had. Can you go back over? And this this is new thinking for me to try to think about what you were talking about earlier here is about you have Christianity and the, the end of the time was Revelation was the church being with Christ, and then Judaism keeps going. Yeah, there is a... That, that, that's confusing. It is, it is. And, and you may join us at lunch. Yeah. We will... Thank <laughs> <laughs> God, I guess we'll get on. Really, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 we can have a great lunch. Yeah. It is, it's... I don't want. I don't want to. I'm not going to answer that right now. But there, but there are answers. There are answers to that, and I and I would like to. But they're 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 lengthy, and I and I and I can't consolidate it and have it make sense uh, in a in a in a brief period of time. But I would love to do that with. Love think, to do that. think of Israel and think of Judaism nationally, not as individual Jews. Right. That's a very important distinction. <laughs> What's going to happen to the Jews as a nation? The very fact that they exist today, isn't that miraculous? It's been 3,000 years. I mean, the Romans are gone, the 
Assyrians are gone, the Persians are gone. The Jews have always existed in spite of tremendous persecution. God has his mark on them, even as Kevin says, they're on the shelf, national. 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 And God's going to pick that up with them nationally as a nation. will be with Christ in that as he as he is king of his people Israel. I don't understand again all of the all of those things, but there are there are ways in which that plays out and I would I would uh, I'd love to go through that with you. But uh, but not here and not now. So and this is primarily a Jewish book. Oh yeah indeed. Indeed. You know, eight tenths of it is it's all for us, but not not, not all to us. And, 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 and this is how things have changed. Now we look and we're like, oh, I, I, I pray for the Jews that some will come and know Christ. In the very beginning, in Acts 15, all those, all those brothers were saying, oh, now look, how, how do these Gentiles, how's this going to work? You know, oh, these guys are crazy. These people are out there. They, they, they Look at the way they live. Look what they eat. Look at all this stuff. You know, and, and how does this fit? How does this work? That's how it began. And now it's the point where the, the Gentile churches look over there. Some think that they're... That they're that they're awful people. That, that they you know they they bomb people around them. They, they have a terrible view of, of the nation of Israel. There are some who think that they're beyond hope when it comes to Christianity. All of this stuff. And in the beginning, it was the exact is the exact opposite opposite of that. Everything about it is a Jewish book. Everything about it is Jewish. And uh, and to pray for the nation of Israel, even though you don't know why. Or how, or, or what to say, or anything else. Just pray for the. But God is God has his, his his hand right around all of it. He knows exactly what's going on. He knows what he's given to him. He knows what he's taken away. He knows what he's going to implement. He knows all of that stuff, all of those things. And uh, and to be a part of him as he does these things is something is a blessing for the body of Christ. The body of Christ. Anybody else? Anything else? Oh, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for being here. There's still a lot of you. I'm so thankful for that. I really am. I'm just so very thankful for that. And uh, thank you for coming. And, uh, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, let's close this prayer. Father, again, for the, the words that we were able to look at here tonight and for the for some of the texts that were that were mentioned, we were reminded of, of Isaiah 53 and that, that uh, Beautiful chapter, beautiful, powerful chapter. The, the upper room discards came into uh, into our discussion here tonight. These are these are portions of the Word of God that need to be that need to be sought out. We need to we need to know what these are and, and read them over and over again and, and uh, simply soak in, uh, in in what we what we see and hear. We talk about what it is to be the Christian and and some of the, the vast changes uh, that have taken place and that, that take place in the life of the believer. And we thank you for those and for what you have made us into, what you have rescued us from. We're grateful for that, Father. Yeah. Yeah. And for this Christianity that, uh, <clears throat> that we just looked at, I pray that we will, uh, that we will dig, that we will seek uh, uh, to know these things. And as, we, and as we take the cake apart, so to speak, and look at all of these different Parts. It, it doesn't take away from the cake. It, it, it just makes us enjoy and understand the cake even more. And so as we, as we study the individual uh, parts of, the, of this recipe, Father, I pray that we will just fall in love with each and every one of them. Uh, they're all yours. And, and how you designed and put all these things together is just uh, it's mind-boggling. It truly is. And so, Father, I pray that you will bless uh, our, our minds with a deeper and a greater presence of yourself. Uh, that's all we ask. Thank you for allowing us to be here tonight in this time of study. Bless us on our, on our <coughs> bring us back Sunday for a wonderful night of worship and fellowship, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.